Australian Centre for Tropical Freshwater Research, which despite its title also does work in the marine environment as well. And, uh, and that's at James Cook University in Townsville. And I'm also strongly associated nowadays with the Marine and Tropical Sciences Research Facility. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge their help in what we're doing, particularly at the moment. Much of what I'm going to talk about, though, dates back to work we've been doing for the last 20 years or so. Um, and that work has been done under a whole range of funding uh, systems and with a huge range of colleagues that I'd like to acknowledge at least briefly now, particularly from a whole range of um, scientific organisations from people like at CSIRO, different divisions of CSIRO, Ames, um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the Queensland state agencies involved in this area like Natural Resources and Water, um, the EPA, the Department of Primary Industries, and also particularly um, a number of other universities that we've been working with, including ANU and Queensland University over the years. Um, and what I'll talk about really reflects that huge effort. Uh, the area we're talking about, mostly I assume you've been hearing so far about the uh, Great Barrier Reef itself out here. Um, I'm going to be also much of the time talking about what we'll call the Great Barrier Reef catchment, catchment area. That's the sum of all these catchments adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef where the water f flows into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon from the rivers that flow through those catchments. Um, that catchment area is basically uh, used primarily for agricultural uh, pursuits. Uh, this sort of, and this is shown on this slide, this sort of pale yellow colour, I guess it looks here, is rangeland beef grazing, which is the major land use across the whole catchment. Hardly any area um, of this whole area that hasn't been grazed at some time. Uh, closer to the coast, there is sugar and horticulture, the yellow particularly sugar. There's some cotton in the Fitzroy, and um, there is some small amount of urban development along the coast as well, which doesn't show up on a scale like this. And it's probably worth remembering that although we do have some urban and coastal development issues, they're still, we still don't really have many people live on this catchment. So there's no big cities at all. Um, Townsville's the biggest city with 150,000 people. So no, none of the sort of big city issue type water quality problems that you may see in overseas countries affecting coral reefs. But they still have some significance. Um, there's been a huge amount of research gone into the issue of water quality in the Great Barrier Reef over the last many years. I estimate about $100 million worth over the last few years only. Um, and this is from a whole range of research initiatives from CRCs and more recently Matt Surf, ARC. Uh, Grumper, of course, has many research and monitoring programs. Um, CSIRO, Water for a Healthy Country, the National Action Plan for Salinity and Water Quality, <laughs> Natural Heritage Trust. The NRM regional bodies are very important, and I'll be talking about those later, um, and their water quality improvement plans and the science that have gone on there. The Queensland agencies I mentioned before as well, EPA, DPI and NRW in particular, Ames, of course, itself, and other universities. And I've probably forgotten some others as well there, but there has been a huge amount of research gone on and um, a lot of money spent. I might also say, I can have my whinge here as well, I suppose, since others have, um, that this is all very, very, I guess the best way to put it would be uncoordinated research. Very little, huge amount going on, much of it in parallel, but very little integration or coordination across this huge amount of research. And one of its biggest, our biggest problems is somehow putting together all this work that's going on in individual project basis into the big picture of what's really happening. And that's a, a huge challenge we still face now. And although we think we might be get slowly getting towards it a bit better, it's still not really happening at the moment. We're still really running 
100 or maybe 200 separate projects um, with little, little formal integration at the top level. Um, to the issue itself, there's, there's been for about 30 years, I suppose, some concerns that um, extra pollutants running off the Great Barrier Reef catchment due to agricultural and urban um, land use on that catchment would be having some long-term effects in the Great Barrier Reef itself. Um, this came from, particularly from concerns where this had happened overseas, not so much in coral reef regions overseas to me, but more in temperate regions where places like the Baltic Sea, Chesapeake Bay, uh, the North Sea, the Northern Adriatic Sea had had that huge increase in um, delivery of materials like sediments and nutrients and organic chemicals like pesticides and where we'd seen large changes in the marine environment as a result. I guess there's always been a concern that something similar could happen in the Great Barrier Reef. At smaller scales overseas, I guess in coral reef regions, we've also seen that um, extra runoff of pollutants has had effect in coral reef regions as well. But there's no area at all, overseas at all of the size of the Great Barrier Reef where this has been looked at in a coral reef region. <laughs> um, there has been continued research um, looking at looking for effects of this. And I've just put a few of those studies up here. Um, the, the early work done in the Sundays, and Steve Blake's here somewhere, um, is involved in this with Rob Van Riesick. Um, looking at the effects of that water quality gradient that exists from through the Whitsundays and its effects on reef health in that area. More recently, the work particularly of Katerina Fabricius and her workers in, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, in comparing reefs in the wet tropics to reefs on Cape York. Um, more, and also that led later into what appears to be uh, reduce inshore reef and uh, biodiversity in the central GBR, which is also correlated with runoff from the catchment. Um, and then more um, complex issues like the belief that I have that we that crown of thorns, the increased frequency of crown of thorns outbreaks are actually driven by nutrient enrichment from the land. Um, I'll just go through a couple of these sorts of studies that, um, that show some of the evidence that we have that there are really effects happening in the Great Barrier Reef. The first one's the one um, that compared reefs in the wet tropics here. Lawrence McCook, who's here somewhere, was involved in this as well, um, with reefs up here in Princess Charlotte Bay on Cape York. And I didn't say this before, perhaps, but one particular feature of the Great Barrier Reef catchment is that you have a southern section, which is basically from the southern end down here up to about here, which is basically where the catchments are uh, well developed, heavily developed, I don't know how strongly to put it, but basically high levels of agricultural activity and an, a northern part where the agricultural development and population and fertiliser use and a whole range of other things like that are minimal at the moment. Um, and so this study focused on looking at reefs here and reefs here, uh, reefs here affected by rivers with, we know, considerable pollutant loads and up here, rivers with low pollutant loads. <laughs> um, just briefly, the, the, the story's complex as all these stories are but there are huge differences in, for instance, hard coral cover between those two groups of reefs that are situated relatively um, in a similar position with respect to the coast. Um, all of this effect is not just going to be due to water quality, we know that. There are other latitudinal effects and so on, but there appears to be some strong correlations between the water quality... <laughs> um, ..that was measured at the time and this, this difference in the, uh, in the two areas, in hard coral cover, soft coral cover, and dead coral, of course, higher in the wet tropics. Um, 
the reefs also look very different. Um, and although there's sometimes the feeling that inshore coral reefs um, are always poor and look terrible, that's not always the case. If you want to go up to Cape York, you can see some beautiful reefs. And many of us who worked on the Great Barrier Reef or lived on the Great Barrier Reef long ago can actually remember central GBR inshore reefs looking like this at one time too, but not many of them look like that anymore. <laughs> um, another set of data that we'll, I'll use is that we have been monitoring chlorophyll. Chlorophyll's the uh, plant pigment, um, in this case present in phytoplankton. Um, we've been monitoring that for a long time, for almost 20 years now in one form or another, um, on a regular basis, and we have chlorophyll transects where we measure chlorophyll up and down the Great Barrier Reef, both inshore and offshore. Um, complicated story again, but I'll try and pick out a few things here. here these, these acronyms are, this is the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef, Capricorn Bunkers, Keppels, Whitsundays, Townsville, Port Douglas, Cairns, and far north, Cooktown, Lizard, right in the far north. And if we just focus on these chlorophyll, so they run <coughs> up here. If we, um, if we just focus on the chlorophyll, forget about the fair fight. And what we see is that chlorophyll in the far north on that undeveloped Cape York coastal area is very low and there is no change right across the shelf. Everywhere else, south of, um, say, Port Douglas, we have a very high section on the inshore part of the Great Barrier Reef, two to three times the value of inshore Cape York. This is the, this is the signal we think of nutrient enrichment in those inshore parts of the southern Great Barrier Reef. This, by southern, I mean south of Port Douglas. Um, offshore, there's the, the chlorophyll drops as you go offshore generally. There are some anomalies here that have got other explanations, but... Basically, this comparison of high inshore chlorophyll in the developed, where the developed catchments are with high nutrient runoff with low chlorophyll off Cape York on the inshore area is a signal of that nutrient enrichment. <laughs> and uh, you can see that in the mean values here. Here's the red, this bar here is far north Cooktown Lizard, and these are the inshore values. So these other four up here of everywhere else. A, a stark change there that takes place there. Some of that signal will also be due to lat natural latitudinal change, but we believe the major part of it is due to nutrient enrichment from rivers south of Port Douglas. Uh, the last example I'll use of the sort of evidence we've been putting together to show what's happening is, is coral cores. Um, you, most people here will realise that these large parietes corals grow for hundreds of years when they're this size, like this one, and you can take cores out of them, and they... And this is particularly the work that uh, Malcolm McCulloch's been involved in and others. They grow in... Janice Luff is here as well. Um, they grow in these annual bands, as shown by X-rays here, and when they're affected by fresh water, or the material in fresh water, they form these fluorescent bands that show up nicely in the UV. Um, and these then can be dated. Each band can be dated. And something can be said about the size of the flood in that particular year and what materials were in the flood water in that particular year because you can cut a little piece of coral out of here or you can analyse a piece of coral from one of these and see what materials were taken up into the coral in that year as a reflection of what was coming off the land. <laughs> um, I'll use a, some examples here from the Burdekin catchment, large catchment in the central part of the Great Barrier Reef region and some corals from Magnetic Island um, and some work by Steve Lewis and others and some corals from Havana Island Reef a little bit further north. Um, work from Malcolm McCulloch and others. And uh, about 
for that, those of you unfamiliar here, uh, the mouth of the Burdick and about 100 kilometres to Magnetic Island and another 100 kilometres further on to Havana Island. Um, from the work of Steve Lewis and others, we see a really clear signal that th this is the years through here, 1814 up to 1982, in this particular coral core from Magnetic Island. And remember, this is 100 kilometres north of the mouth of the Burdekin River. The first sheep were put on the Burdekin catchment in the southern part of the Burdekin catchment in 1850 here. And then later, there was a huge number of cattle put onto the Burdekin catchment by the 1860s. And what we see is, in this particular case in manganese, a huge change in the content of manganese in the coral. What we believe is happening here is that there was a store of manganese in the surface soil um, that had been built up over many years, um, th probably through burning activities. Um, and with the introduction of sheep and erosion, almost immediate erosion of the catchment, um, this was flushed out in a very short space of time. It only took really one or two years for this to happen. And we see this huge spike of manganese. So the manganese itself, in a sense, isn't important. What we're showing here is that that signal of land use change on the Burdekin is transmitted to the corals 100 kilometres north of the Burdekin River almost instantly. Um, and that other materials in, in the runoff that we might be more concerned about than manganese itself will also be transmitted to those corals and affect the water quality in which they're growing. Um, some other indicators that are used are barium. Barium is an element associated with sediment. Um, and when it hits the, when it's discharged into the marine environment, it dissolves off the coral and travels in the water in a dissolved form and it can then be taken up by coral, replacing the calcium. It's similar in the, in the structure of the coral. We see the same signal here around 1860 to 1880. Um, in this case, from um, Malcolm McCulloch's work at Havana Island, further north, um, and some yttrium, another element, from, in a coral from Magnetic Island. So this is both two different reefs. Um, um, start to increase when the cattle numbers start to go up on the vertical catchment. These are signals also of soil erosion. And from this sort of data, Malcolm McCulloch's uh, made estimates that, that uh, erosion increased by factors of about five times, I think, from memory. And uh, this matches some data I'll show you later where we've modelled erosion on the vertical catchment and come to similar um, conclusions that, that tr the export of sediments increased by factors like of about five times. <laughs> so just from those few examples, I guess we think we've got evidence that material is getting from the land out into the Great Barrier Reef to various distances and um, in different places, that there's effects going on on phytoplankton communities, as sh shown through chlorophyll, and on reefs um, as sh shown through the condition of the reef. Um, and the next question, of course, is what's really driving this change, change water quality? Well, we have some pretty fair idea of what that's likely to be before we even started long ago. Obviously, increased soil erosion. Um, European cattle types um, with hard hooves um, cause um, a lot of... Um, extra soil erosion in catchments compared to our native animals. Um, there's a, since the 1950s, we've had large increases in the amount of fertiliser used and some's lost. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Of course, pesticides as well. And the other side that comes in as well is that we used to have lots of wetlands and riparian vegetation. Most of that's now gone. <laughs> So for the next few minutes, I'll talk a bit about some of the evidence we've got now of where the pollutants are coming from, the monitoring and modelling we've been doing on catchments to determine which industries are actually generating the pollutants we're worried about. Um, this just shows some of those increases I talked about, fertiliser use on the Great Barrier Reef catchment, um, particularly taking off in about 1960, nitrogen fertiliser, phosphorus fertiliser, and the loss of wetland 
in this case near Ingham in the Herbert catchment. Um, these are quite, and, and we know that for freshwater wetlands in the Great Barrier Reef catchment area, there's probably less than 20% of what was originally there. <laughs> um, overall, I guess the modelling we've been doing associated with monitoring comes up with numbers like this, that we think there's about five times as much suspended sediment coming out of the Great Barrier Reef catchment as 150 years ago, three times as much nitrogen, um, and a few times more phosphorus as well. I might say also that nitrogen's interesting. Although the total nitrogen's only gone up three times, the amount of bi fully bioavailable nitrogen in the form of nitrate's probably gone up 20 times. And that's particularly over the last uh, 50 years since the use of fertiliser, inorganic fertilisers. We also have some clear ideas where this material comes from, from modelling that's going on and continued to be going on. We're able to run catchment <laughs> models that identify how much or what the source areas of the material that's actually getting to the coast. So this isn't generation of pollutants, but really that part of the pollutant load that gets to the coast. So areas up here in the back of the catchment, little of that material actually gets to the coast. So we have low numbers here, but higher numbers along the coast. <laughs> Our monitoring programs have been focusing in a few areas, particularly in the wet tropics, um, in the Lower Burdicate, in the Burdicate and Fitzroy catchments and in Mackaywit Sunday region, where we've been monitoring water quality um, in association with a whole range of other state agencies and CSIRO. Um, and we do it at a range of scales. At, um, this is a rather confused list of scales, but small scales at the farm scale, where we're actually monitoring what comes off individual farms, um, sub-catchment scales, catchment scales, out in the marine environment in flood plumes, and, and of course in marine waters and on reef and seagrass areas directly. So throughout the whole system. Um, typically I'm going to use the Pioneer River here near Mackay um, as an example of some of the work we've been doing. Just one example, the Pioneer's broken up into uh, the sort of purpley colours, sugar, urban, red, and these are forested areas up the back here and grazing across here. Um, high level of sugarcane in this catchment, more than 20% of the area is sugarcane. We have broken the catchment up into a whole set of small sub-catchments, which are dominated by one land use. So we have three forest sub-catchments, three grazing sub-catchments, three sugar cane catchments, one urban development, so this is where they're developing urban um, area and two developed urban drainages. And we monitor these in flow events and look at what comes off each type of land use. Um, in this case here, we have some pesticides, herbicides, diuron, um, and this is somewhat representative of some of the other herbicides, basically herbicides associated with sugarcane, not really too much any other land use. Not surprising because this is, that's the crop they use these herbicides on, but we're able to show quite clearly that the herbicide, you might think this is silly, it's obvious it's going to be from sugar if that's what they're using it on, but we have some interesting discussions with farmers about where herbicides might come from out of the air, out of the rainforest, out of, by magic from other places. And uh, these are quite clear then that you can, or Dirons use as an anti-fouling on boats. So once, you know, if you find it in the water, then it's obviously come from boats and not from sugarcane, but data like this allows us to immediately say exactly where this really is coming from. Um, similar, this is nitrate and, and, nit um, and th these are basically also associated with sugar because of fertiliser use in this case, um, and in this case some, we think some uh, sewerage overflow as well in this particular case here. Um, and you can differentiate, once again, the sources, that there is some nitrate coming out of grazing areas, but low compared to what comes out of sugar. <laughs> um, the herbicide story, I think, is interesting in that it's a, 
a newer issue and uh, we're only just starting to realise that we have problems with pesticides again, which we thought we'd solved about 20 years ago when the DDT type ones were banned. And uh, here's some nice data from 2005 in the Pioneer River um, that half a tonne of diuron was discharged in a couple of days through the mouth of the river um, and a little bit less in, two th sorry, in 2002 and a little bit less in 2005, along with some other, quite a lot of other herbicides as well. Um, and, but this sort of data has raised the profile that we're now once again worried about herbicides um, or pesticides in general without being really clear about a really good idea of what the real risk is. Um, I'll just say that we have similar results from other areas. I concentrated a bit on the pioneer there. Tully's no different. Same sort of story, sugarcane horticulture. We find herbicides in the river, offshore, even in the dry season offshore, well offshore out here. So uh, these herbicides are getting well out into the Great Barrier Reef here and possibly even to the mid-shelf. We've got some results now as well. Um, there's a lot of work gone into looking at the likely effect of these herbicides on reef organisms. And I want to just mention that a lot of this work's been done by, originally by Jones, nowadays by Andrew Negri and his group at Ames. Um, and we are starting to get a much better idea, hence, of the risk by combining the knowledge of effects of herbicides on reef organisms mm -hmm on things like coral recruitment and the like, and the survival of recruits, um, along with the concentrations we're finding in the marine environment, that allows us to at least to make some crude estimates of whether there's a real risk or not. <laughs> um, and from that, we can draw conclusions like this from the work. We know the concentrations at the river mouth, at seagrass beds, at the inshore reef sites, we know the work from the experimental work of what a f concentration um, effects start to happen, hence there's probably some risk. Um, we need to go a long way further yet to really quantify this risk before we can force some better management, but um, this definitely looks like there is some risk from the concentration data we have combined with the experimental testing data of toxicity. So I think I won't go through this, but um, pesticides are, um, we think, are something that we'd forgotten about in the past, um, assumed there wasn't a problem, and have now really come up as a potential major problem again for the future. <laughs> uh, we've been studying what happens in the marine environment to the actual flood water as it comes out. And uh, my favourite photo here, we were talking about at lunchtime as well, of a wonderful algal bloom off the Whitsunday coast here, um, taken in Landsat and, uh, in 2005. Um, this is basically a large-scale phytoplankton bloom. You can see the pioneer catchment I talked about here before, and this is the Proserpine O'Connell catchments up here, uh, dominated by sugarcane, and with, we already know, large levels of nitrogen discharge from these rivers, producing this algal bloom. This algal bloom in later, we have a number of satellite images of this now, moved basically right out into the mid-shelf of the Great Barrier Reef eventually, after about a week. Um, and really, we have some nice images from this year as well, 2007, of this happening up and down the coast. And we know now that nutrients from the land can get not just to the outer Great Barrier Reef, but into the middle of the Coral Sea. We have evidence of those nutrients from the, these rivers, uh, five to 600 kilometres offshore. So this has been a bit of a change in our thinking. I guess we were thinking that, you know, mostly these effects were restricted to inshore areas, say 50 kilometres, probably like here. Um, we know now that this material gets much further off the coast. What it's doing out there, we don't know. <laughs> Um, we understand how the um, plumes move well, a bit better now. We have some models, but you can see that even within one day, the wind can shift. This is the burdekin plume, very muddy, um, a lot of sediment, can move the plume 
different directions, being forced north here by the wind and the day later being forced more to the south and east. Um, the studies we did in that algal bloom in 2005, uh, chlorophyll levels are about 20, 20 times ambient, I suppose. They can be up to thousands of times higher in the in intense part of the algal bloom where there's a lot of trichodesmium. Um, there may be some link between the actual runoff and the trichodesmium blooms. We're still looking at that, particularly associated with phosphorus. Um, and I guess one of the concerns that we look at occasionally, but not properly yet, is, is this extra nutrient changing the phy phytoplankton species composition in the lagoon as well. Um, and hence implications for further trophic change of particularly um, Phyto, uh, plankton communities in the in the lagoon, which is still very poorly known. <laughs> um, overall, the sort of conclusions we come from from studying this catchment to reef in an area like Mackay that um, nutrients and herbicides are associated with sugar, um, suspended sediments not really a problem here because they've managed that ra rather well in sugar cane. Um, the, we see algal blooms driven by the bioavailable nutrients come out. We're able to have track these plumes much further offshore than we believe they extended in the past. Um, there may be effects on phytoplankton communities and we're still worried about the herbicides. <laughs> um, and that gives us some sort of general understanding of what's going on, of what happens in plumes. Um, more generally across the whole Great Barrier Reef that um, about differential transport of particulate pollutants versus dissolved pollutants and at least some effort or some understanding now, I think, of differential risk. Uh, one of our main concerns is that we probably can't manage everything on the Great Barrier Reef catchment, sediments, nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, herbicides, endocrine disrupting substances, um, it's quite difficult. So we'd, much, we'd like to have better understanding of which are the real issues. Um, we're also involved in a lot of modelling. Um, Brad Sherman's down the front here somewhere. We're involved through CSIRO and Natural Resources and Water in catchment modelling. What, what catchment modelling allows us to do is, is pid down along with our monitoring programs the sources of material that need to be managed. And this is a complicated, lots of numbers here, but this is in Tully. Percentage of the whole Tully catchment that is taken up by different industries, you'll see across the top here, 84% is rainforest, 5% sugar. If you look at the, the nitrate, however, that comes out of the Tully River, 78% of it comes from the sugar, 5% of the sugar area. So from this sort of work, we're able to say, if you want to manage nitrate, there's only one target, and that's the sugar. Horticulture is bananas in this case, is also putting out an a large amount compared to its area, but overall, um, sugar becomes the target if, you're, if your real concern is nitrate. And so this sort of modelling allows us to really prioritise where we're trying to set targets. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have, I'll, I won't go through this, but we have, for Tully, we have similar sorts of conclusions than we had for um, the Pioneer. So we, we were also looking at the differences between regions, and in this case, Tully's quite similar to the Pioneer, but if I had conclusions about our work in the Burdekin, we'd see some very different conclusions. So there's regional differences up and down the coast. We're um, trying also over many years now to try and quantify the area at risk from very simple first attempts here where Jane Waterhouse drew a line along the coast with a red pen. <laughs> um, and we said, well, that's probably where the main risk of land runoff is to more sophisticated models here where we actually have a model that tries to quantify the degree of risk to land runoff on a spatial basis to some recent work we're doing where we're trying to do it much better again, a more sophisticated model, and one that allows us to run 
management scenarios. So what we have here is wherever we are, a tully again. Um, here's the current exposure of to dissolved inorganic nitrogen, let's say nitrate, um, of areas off the mouth of the Tully River. Here would be the exposure levels in the same units if we managed fertiliser in a certain way. This is a particularly effective way of managing fertiliser use called nitrogen fixation. Um, and we're able to see that we're able to reduce the level of exposure to nitrate by using these models and help us then to set targets of what we really want to reduce nitrate output from the Tully River to, to achieve some sort of goal in the marine environment. And we have a, 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 without going into the details, we're now starting to have some models, although we've still got a long way to go here, of connecting what's coming out of the river with indicators in the marine environment. Although I'll also say this is a huge um, uncertain area at the moment and we're still struggling with trying to set, if we want a particular target in the marine environment for sediment or nutrients or chlorophyll or reef condition, what have we got to reduce sediment or nitrate or diron discharge to to actually achieve that. The modelling requirements of doing that at the moment are very difficult, but we do have some, we do have some beginnings of trying to do that to quantitatively be able to set targets for the river, which will achieve targets offshore. Um, I'll finish up now by talking about what's happening in the management of all of this. Um, well, the obvious thing, you've heard of something at least mentioned already, that in 2003, um, we have a state and, and federal reef water quality protection plan um, Sheridan Morris, who's here somewhere too, or was heavily involved with this particular plan at the time that was uh, developed out of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in particular. Um, and it has a target here, a fairly fuzzy target, I'll say, but an initial target to halt and reverse the decline in water quality entering the reef within 10 years. You'll notice that's not very quantitative in any way, and also. It was, it's a policy document, obviously, didn't really have a technical implementation attached to it of how this was going to happen, but it's there. And that was our first real plan that something was going to happen. Um, the question might be, you saw me say that there was $100 million spent on research getting towards, to some extent, to getting towards this. Um, it obviously needs to be funded as well, that, that right at this moment, um, there's possibility of actually really funding this work, but that real commitment hasn't been totally made yet to fund this. On the, on the ground, there's been a lot of activity in the last few years um, at a much more local scale, where we're finally getting to grips, I think, with local on-the-ground management that could achieve that overall target for the Great Barrier Reef. And this is particularly happening through these water quality improvement plans. Um, that are happening at a regional scale up and down the coast. Um, some of them um, almost finished and some still in the somewhat earlier stages. This is the first attempt that I see where to get scientists, biophysical scientists, social scientists, econo economists together and looking at actual on-ground actions, what they're going to cost, whether they're going to be effective and whether we could meet targets through the plans as they stand. Um, and at the moment, these are really where the action are, is. Um, and, but this, as, as I've noted there, there, most of them are still in preparatory stage. And I don't think we've seen one implemented properly yet. So um, it'll be Tully probably the first one off the rank in terms of a very comprehensive plan that's in draft form at the moment. We're hoping it's going to be, implementation is going to be funded and um, that will involve a co collaboration between industry, like the sugar industry, um, NRM groups and science people and the government, state and federal government, to actually make something happen. <laughs> uh, there are other things going on. There's a project called Nutrient Management Zones where we've identified the areas that need fertiliser management as a priority, wet tropics, Mackaywit Sunday, 
other areas less so, um, and that's moving along slowly as well. And I suppose in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, we believe we have enough evidence that this is really a significant issue, um, runoff from the land. We're still uncertain about the relative significance of sediment versus nutrients, versus nutrients from fertiliser and from soil erosion, pesticides and other substances. Still a lot of issues to be sorted out there. There's a lot of... It's not all the same. Um, there's variations along the coast. The whole Great Barrier Reef coastal area is not the same. Different issues in different places, which complicates it. Um, of course, we recognise this huge interaction with other stresses that the reef's under, particularly climate change. And there is a pro research program also looking at the interactions between water quality and climate change going on. Um, a lot of money's been spent on research. Um, as I say again, this is poorly integrated and coordinated. And um, In fact, it's not integrated or coordinated at all, but... Um, we're hoping that that will improve in the future as well because I think it loses a lot of its value for that reason. The management response is still in the planning stage. There really hasn't been any money spent on the ground yet. Um, and, well, we're hopeful. Um, the, the governments, the Commonwealth and state government, have, I guess, are committed to this in, in words and eventually a large amount of money will have to be committed to make it happen. Um, that hasn't actually happened yet, but I guess we're hopeful. And as John Tanza said, it's the next five years we'll, which we'll see whether we actually get some real action on the ground to actually resolve this problem. Thank you. <laughs>